So goalie everyone, my name is Stacy Kuhn. I'm director of the Oneida Nation Museum and I am here at the Neville Public Museum. I would like to welcome you to our exhibit entitled Traditional Arts of the Oneida. The Oneida Nation Museum's role in collaborating with the Oneida Nation Arts Program and the Neville Public Museum um, is you know, one of the highlights for us of, of 2020 in that it Although the Oneida Nation Museum was closed, it allowed us um, the ability to have a physical place to be able to showcase um, Oneida artists' work, as well as those um, traditional art forms that our culture and our people is so well known for, which would be our silver work, Oneida pottery, and Oneida basket making, which is the three art forms that are highlighted here. So we're very happy to have been asked um, to co-create this exhibit um, and very happy that the Neville Public Museum asked us to be a part of that. Um, and so here we are. I'm Kevin Cullen, the deputy director here at the Neville Public Museum and the co-curator for this exhibition, Reviving Traditional Arts of the Oneida, the Oneodaka. So as Stacy was explaining, this is a really a unique opportunity for the museum, the Neville, to collaborate with our community partners uh, for this exhibition and highlighting contemporary artists as well as materials from our collections, archaeological and historic. So the three art forms, uh, really were inspired by that collaboration with the Oneida Nation Arts Program and the grant, the 20 years uh, grant, as it was called, to bring an app apprentice and uh, master craftspeople together in the effort of maintaining these traditional art forms for future generations. So really our role is to highlight those three art forms. And we made a call to artists in the community during the pandemic and were received with uh, numerous submissions. So although the initial concept sort of evolved because of various uh, issues with, with the public health emergency and just access to artists, not all the artists that are exhibited here were actually part of the Oneida Nation Arts Program, but it became its own entity in many ways. It was inspired from those initial conversations in February, 2020, to then ultimately when we open the exhibit about a year later. And so it involves interviews with artists uh, from a 13 year old silversmith apprentice uh, all the way to we have interviews with uh, a potter in her 90s, Rose Kerstetter. So really it is an archive in some ways of the history of the Oneida people in Wisconsin and their art forms that exist both here and also back in New York State where they originally came from. So let's learn a little bit about the Haudenosaunee and the people of the Longhouse. So the Oneida Nation is a federally recognized tribe made up of over 17,000 tribal members worldwide. Um, our reservation was established in 1838 by treaty and it encompasses over 65,400 acres of land. The Oneida Nation belongs to a confederacy of nations known as the Iroquois or Haudenosaunee Confederacy, whose original homeland is what is now central New York State. Traditionally known as the Iroquois Confederacy or the League of Five Nations, the preferred name is the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, meaning people of the Longhouse. It originally included the five First Nations tribes native to New York State, namely the Cayuga, Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, and Seneca. The alliance was strengthened in 1794 with the Treaty of Canandaigua, which added the Tuscarora tribe to the new Six Nations Grand Council. The council was formed to unite the nations and create a peaceful means of decision making. Through the Grand Council, each of the nations of the Haudenosaunee are united by the common goal to live in harmony. The Great Law of Peace is the oral constitution that the Haudenosaunee Confederacy was founded on. The concept was conceived by the great peacemaker of the Huron Nation and Hiawatha of the Onondaga Nation. Before the Confederacy was formed, the five nations continually battled one another, so brutally that the tribes were on the verge of extinction. The first tribes to accept the concept of peace are the Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, and the Seneca, making the Confederacy or the League of Five Nations. 
Each nation maintains its own council with chiefs chosen by the clan mother and deals with, with its own internal affairs, but allows the Grand Council to deal with issues affecting the nations within the Confederacy. In life, the Haudenosaunee strive to create beauty in all that they do, guided by the philosophy of having a good mind gifted to them by the peacemaker. So as Stacy mentioned, we are standing in this section as you walk into the exhibit uh, on the other side of the entrance is something that's kind of unique that uh, we thought we would bring forward, not just talking about the art forms, but the history of how the Oneida came to Wisconsin. So as she mentioned in 1838, uh, it was the treaty lands were actually established with the Menominee Nation. They ceded some of their land to the Oneidas coming from New York. Uh, and this was the third or second wave of the Oneida that first came in 1823 uh, with Eliezer Williams. They were the Christian party. The Orchard Party came in 1838. And in that uh, treaty, which is right here, you'll see actually some of the signees or signators of that, uh, both from the Oneida, but also from the federal government. And it was actually under um, President Martin Van Buren, who is, was the head president, of course, at the time uh, in 1838. And you can learn about some of those individual characters and their specific names of who and what they were actually uh, allowed to uh, and given rights to in Wisconsin territory at that stage. This is before Wisconsin was an official state, of course, uh, 10 years, in fact, before statehood in 1848. The Haudenosaunee people not only share commonalities in their languages, histories, and social structure, but also in their life ways, such as the style of their pottery. Iroquois pottery share similarities that can be traced back over 1,000 years based on archaeological excavations in New York State and across the Great Lakes. These clay vessels were used for storing and cooking food for their families and communities. They are globular in shape with distinct collars around the rim and are often incised with geometric patterns. Soon after the Europeans began arriving on the shores of the Haudenosaunee homeland in the late 16th century, the traditions of making pottery ceased. The loss of tradition occurred as European trade goods, such as brass kettles, metal pots, and glazed ceramics, replaced the fragile earthenware pottery cooking vessels that for generations Oneida and other Haudenosaunee people had produced. So um, Oneida pottery started um, actually just, just based out of a, a utilitarian need. Um, and that need was primarily for food preparation as well as um, for cooking, cooking over a fire. And um, it wasn't until around the, the uh, late woodland period that the designs of the collar, collars of the pot started to become more detailed and more intricate. Um, more specifically with uh, castellations that a lot of, um, which are little figurines that go around the pots that a lot of the Haudenosaunee are known for. Um, it wasn't until the um, late woodland period that, um, as, as well as the contact with Europeans, that the style um, and the techniques and um, the making of pottery was abandoned for um, the more metal containers that the Europeans had brought to them from the New World. Um, one of the most noted Oneida artists um, in our community um, that was known for making her Oneida pottery um, more similar to this historic period would be Rose Kerstetter. Uh, Rose Kerstetter grew up on the Oneida Reservation in the 1980s, she received a degree in fine arts um, and she came back home to Oneida with the specific purpose of revitalizing Haudenosaunee pottery. Um, she had spent some time out in the Southwest where she was going to college and learned a lot about um, Pueblo pottery in particular and wanted to come home and uh, knew that her people had also made pottery. And so she came back home and, and wanted to um, revitalize that, that art form back into the community. And so she came back in the 1980s and did just that. Um, we have several pots in our collection from Rose Kerstetter, um, as well as she was actually the master artist to Jennifer Stevens, whose pottery we also have on display here at the Neville Public Museum. Um, and 
Rose Kerstetter um, took on the more traditional style of what is now known as Haudenosaunee or Oneida pottery, um, but a more contemporary version of Oneida pottery um, would be a, a more recent artist, and her name is Barb Webster. Barb Webster actually takes um, two traditional art forms, <clears throat> one that is raised beadwork, which the Haudenosaunee are very well known for, and she incorporates that into um, her pots, and we have those on display here as, as well. Um, so you have both the traditional aspects of what is Oneida pottery, but you also have contemporary aspects that the artists today are incorporating into the art forms that they do, but still keeping that traditional form and aspect of pottery still intact. And you can see that with Barb Webster's work. So as we were talking more about pottery and its evolution through time, really it comes down to inspiration for an artist. And often that inspiration comes from the archeological record or museum collections. So I'm standing in front of a case that have two pieces of pottery in it from the museum, the Neville Public Museum's collection. It turns out they came from and were excavated up in uh, Little Sturgeon Bay in Door County uh, at the early 20th century uh, at a site called the Parched Corn Site. Now, as an archaeologist myself, I was very excited to look at this and investigate these pottery forms because it's different than any pottery that you find in Wisconsin made by uh, uh, Anishinaabe peoples or ancient cultures that lived here like the, the Menominee or the Ho-Chunk. And archaeologically, you can type, you put art artifacts or types of pottery into different typologies or styles. So generally within a household, Pottery or any other art form is passed down through generations where you learn from an elder and you repeat or produce similar styles that you learned in those techniques. So archaeologically, oftentimes those styles don't change very often and you can actually then understand where different peoples or cultures lived uh, on the landscape based on the pottery that they made. So the pottery that we have here in this case that was found in Door County is called Kayaduda incised. So Kayaduda, it turns out, is actually from likely the Mohawk people in upstate New York. And therefore, we have now archaeological evidence of the Mohawk or somebody within the Haudenosaunee uh, Confederacy actually being in Wisconsin around 1500 to 1600, way before the first waves of uh, settled Oneida people come here. So what that tells us is that there is a maritime connection across the Great Lakes through Lake Erie into Lake Huron and into Lake Michigan and into the Bay of Green Bay almost 500 years ago, uh, which is maybe even longer than that. But archaeologically, it becomes a source of both informative knowledge about how people have moved throughout the Great Lakes through time based on the things that are left behind, the artifacts. And pottery is a good one because it stays intact in the ground. But it also shows that the artists today can pull out a drawer up in our collections in a museum, which was why they're so vital, these museums, to, to care for these objects, to tell their stories, because it inspires the artists that then produce this work to, as their ancestors have generations before them. Metalwork, particularly copper, have been part of the artistic and utilitarian toolkit of the Great Lakes American Indian tribes for thousands of years. Silver, however, is the most symbolic of all metals among the Haudenosaunee people. Introduced during the fur trade in the 17th century as a trade item, silver quickly became an outward sign of cultural interaction and adaptation. By the end of the fur trade, in the late 18th and early 19th century, and although having established designs of their own prior to contact, Haudenosaunee silversmiths interwove and adapted some European designs to further incorporate clan and spiritual symbols important to the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. The silverwork was traded among the Oneida, Mohawk, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and others. By the mid-19th century, Wisconsin Oneida-made silverwork had diminished until its revival in the mid-20th century. Iroquois silverwork um, came about as a result of the fur trade in the 
in the late 1800s. Um, and it, it has been told that was, there was a Haudenosaunee silversmith in nearly every Haudenosaunee village around that time. Some of the contemporary styles of uh, Iroquois silverwork, um, the, some of the examples that we have here more specifically with Colleen Benz is she does um, more traditional style uh, Haudenosaunee artwork with the um, the sun symbols, um, as well as she does some um, contemporary styles as well. And that would be um, examples in this case right here of some contemporary pieces or pins that she had created that um, could be used as a form of, of, of protection. Um, and also she creates silver chalices. Another thing that Colleen Benz is, is known for as well is the Haudenosaunee silver brooches, which um, back in the 1800s, Haudenosaunee silversmiths were known for creating massive amounts of, of these uh, brooches. And the purpose of these brooches were used um, to decorate their garments, but also to fasten um, some of the garments onto um, other areas of, of their body. And um, it's said and it is written that um, these brooches could number anywhere from three to 400 um, on, on one single piece of garment. And that this, um, the reason this was done was as a sign of wealth um, in, in a lot of these Haudenosaunee villages. So um, one of the examples of incorporating our oral histories into the silver work would be examples of Yitlay McLester and Portia Wheelock. They incorporated um, a wampum shell, which um, was representative of the moon in their silver work, as well as women that were under, that are situated under that moon. And this is indicative of the um, connection and correlation between women as well as the uh, phases of the moon, um, but also um, based on the fact that um, women give life, but we are also uh, a matrilineal society. So we follow the clan of the mother. And so those are representations um, and examples of our oral histories and our culture directly um, put onto the silver work. So Ralph Corn Cornelius is one of the most noted Oneida artists um, who is very well known for doing Oneida silver work, but he's also more particularly known for doing um, the silver brooch designs. Um, and you'll see several examples here on exhibit. But Ralph um, Cornelius learned from a gentleman by the name of Richard Christian. Richard Christian was actually in Oneida from New York um, who visited the Oneida Nation Museum in the 1980s. And Ralph took one of his classes and was immediately inspired um, by the process of making these silver brooches and was also inspired by the, the cultural connection that um, these silver brooches had with Oneida. And so he went to school, um, got his degree as well in fine arts and came back in the 1980s um, and started uh, teaching classes um, at the Oneida Nation Museum as well as the Oneida Nation Arts Program in hopes of inspiring other young Oneida silver makers uh, to create silver brooches, which we're known for. And really what is exciting for us here at the Neville was to bring out some of the silver work from our collection, Trade Silver. Um, as Stacy mentioned, I mean, it's hundreds of years old from the fur trade period. Uh, Wisconsin sort of begins that time period around 1634, if we believe Jean Nicolet and his landing here uh, in the Bay of Green Bay. So from that time, really from the late 1600s onwards, you have then these metal forms, silver coming into the region used for trade items uh, in exchange for things like fur pelts, um, hence the fur trade. But of course, that's not the only metal form that was here during that time, copper as an indigenous metal was mined out of rivers and out of the bedrock all the way up through uh, northern Wisconsin and into the upper peninsula of Michigan. And that form of metallurgy is over 5,000 years old. So 
Native communities throughout the Great Lakes had knowledge of metalwork and produced wonderful pieces that are seen in archaeological collections and have been excavated over uh, many generations. It's really the silver, that bright, shining white metal that really caught the eye and the attention of Haudenosaunee artists and community members, particularly women of these villages that wore, as Stacy said, sometimes hundreds of them on their garments. So the garments that we have here, we have a shawl. It's likely actually uh, from the Ho-Chunk, or as that we're known as the Winnebago, uh, but it dates to the late 1800s. Uh, but the actual silver buckles on them themselves are several hundred years in terms of the style of how they were punched out of the metal itself um, and etched with varying designs. So silver work is one of those forms that we're very excited to still see as a, as a vital form of art, as adornment, even for earrings, brooches, among other things. So um, this section of the exhibit is, is quite beautiful in that respect. Baskets were originally made by the Haudenosaunee for utilitarian reasons such as storage, food preparation, and transportation. Various social changes such as the loss of land and changing gender roles affected the Haudenosaunee economic system and made basket making an important financial advantage in some communities. Work baskets were commonly made as trade items. Later, storage baskets were decorated with stamp designs made from carved potatoes dipped in paint or dyes. By the end of the 19th century, the weaving styles had become more intricate. Sweetgrass was also incorporated into the designs. Baskets were sold to tourists at Niagara Falls and at various trading posts throughout New York. So Haudenosaunee black ash baskets um, derived again out of a basic utilitarian need um, and that was for food storage, food preparation, as well as transportation of items um, to and from different places. Um, as gender roles started to change and um, economic differences started to change as well, um, the, the creation of the basket in terms of its form and um, decorative aspect started to change around the late 1800s. This was as a result of the changes in the gender roles as well as um, economic changes that some Haudenosaunee were experiencing um, in New York State at that time in the late 1800s. So as a result, the um, designs of the baskets started to change and it, it pretty much propelled the look of the basket to one that was not necessarily out of need, but one that was more for decorative purposes. Because at this time, um, Haudenosaunee women were using the baskets and creating the baskets to sell at um, the Niagara Falls region, which is in the state of New York, to tourists at the time. And the reason why they were doing this was they needed to provide for their families. And so with that need um, came the black ash basket in its, in its more decorative form that you see today here. So um, the, the wood of choice for the Haudenosaunee and Oneida was black ash. Um, and so a lot of, um, around the late 1800s, a lot of these baskets were made from um, the black ash wood. However, over time um, and more currently with the threat of the emerald ash borer, the um, accumulation of black ash is uh, starting to become very rare. And so a lot of Haudenosaunee and Oneida artists are experimenting with other pieces of, um, of wood um, to create these similar style baskets that they would have made back in the late 1800s. Um, one of the more um, well-known Oneida basket tree maker here in Oneida is Mamie Ryan. And Mamie Ryan um, started um, classes, started taking classes in the 1980s at the Oneida Nation Museum and she acquired um, 
the skills uh, needed to, to create these baskets. And she later on became very well known for creating black ash baskets. Um, she demonstrated their techniques, taught classes, as well as sold these baskets. And she was very well known for making them. We have um, several of her baskets in our collection. But a more contemporary artist um, that's fairly new to basket making is Ray Skinnador. Uh, Ray Skinnador not only makes um, black ash baskets, but she also experiments with other forms of um, wood and wood fibers um, to create a lot of her, her art forms. Uh, the one in particular that you see here um, but another aspect that, that Ray incorporates into her work is not only just Haudenosaunee, it's, um, she also incorporates, uh, other Native nations, um, techniques, uh, into her basket making. So for instance, the, the jingle dress form, um, the jingle dress is actually an Ojibwe dance for healing, but, um, Ray shows you that, um, you know, Oneida artists um, can not only do the traditional art forms, they're also very well versed um, in making art forms from, um, in representing other native nations as well. So as Stacy explained very well, is that Mamie Ryan to Ray Skinnendor, we have this continuity from uh, at least a generation or two of basket making. Of course, it's much older than that. We don't know for sure how long baskets have been made. It, uh, you know, certainly they're one of the more utilitarian objects for carrying food with you. Um, but what we have really is also now high level of, of artistry. And one another artist that is worth recognizing too is Richard Gonzalez. And he uh, is a contemporary uh, Oneida basket maker. Um, he uses a, a variety of other materials too, not just black ash because of, of course, as we heard, the, the emerald ash borer and the lack of resources for making those. So he's using things like jute and hemp and reeds to produce various forms that incorporate also Oneida oral history into them, in particular antlers, the use of deer antlers. And that was often used uh, as a symbol and outward expression um, by the elders or tribal leaders uh, called the Augustaue, which is the headdress that was used. And so he talks about that in the, in the interviews that were also recorded and on exhibit here at the Neville. Uh, we have from our collection at the Neville Public Museum, two baskets as well, early 20th century, likely trade baskets from the Oneida Nation Reservation. Uh, one very large basket, likely a storage basket. We don't know exactly what it was used for, but again, showing that juxtapositions of traditional forms to very high level um, forms of art. And also incorporating then oral history, whether it's the headdress, but also the three sisters, the corn, beans, and squash that is also uh, incorporated into some of the art forms too. So it's a wonderful space to contemplate. It, uh, it weaves together past and present. Reviving Traditional Arts of the Oneida is a collaborative exhibit developed by the Oneida Nation Museum, the Oneida Nation's Art Program, and the Neville Public Museum. The work featured in this exhibit highlights three traditional Haudenosaunee art forms, basketry, pottery, and silverwork. The work was produced as part of a grant where mentor artists taught apprentices the techniques of crafting these art forms so they could be passed on to future generations. The roots of the Oneida Nation's art program began around a kitchen table in the 1970s when Oneida artists began discussing ways of supporting each other and developing art in the community. In 1994, the ONAP was formally established as an agency within the United Tribe of Indians in Wisconsin. The mission of the Oneida Nation's art program is to promote diverse artistic expression within the community, reflecting its heritage and spirit for future generations.